Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the trial of the major Nazi war criminals before the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg um, is commonly reckon, uh, reckoned as the most important advent in the history of international criminal law. In fact, I think it's fair to say that some would claim that the very field of international criminal law was created by the International Military Tribunal, referred to as the IMT, that is the first Nuremberg trial. That is, it established for the very first time the principle of individual criminal responsibility in international law. And whatever j doubts jurists might have had at the time of the staging of the IMT of the Nuremberg trial, I think these have now largely been answered by history. Um, if the IMT once struggled against the taint of victor's justice, six decades after its original staging, the trial's prestige has never been higher. Uh, in fact, I think it's fair to say that jurists, legal scholars, historians, groups that often manage to disagree about a great deal of things appear unified in their praise of the Nuremberg trial. Conferences that were staged uh, to coincide with the 60th anniversary of that trial a few years ago had a celebratory, even kind of a hagiographic uh, quality. And law students around the globe now dutifully study the so-called Nuremberg principles, the norms of international law, which insist, among other things, that acts of states and superior orders uh, supply no defense for the charge of perpetrating international crimes. Now, by contrast, the Eichmann trial has largely been rele relegated to a footnote by scholars of international law. The trial often warrants no more than a brief mention in legal uh, textbooks and is generally seen to have delivered very little in the way of precedent for the development of this field. Uh, among the numerous conferences that are now being staged to coincide with the Eichmann trial's 50th anniversary, I know of only one that's been organized by a faculty of law. And this event hasn't attracted a particular amount of, uh, of um, interest within the legal community. And I think it's even interested that, interesting that it's the Taub Center that is convening this event rather than, for example, the law school. And I don't know, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but how many people from the law school are here? It's a very indicative. Um, now, I think perhaps in part, um, this might have something to do with the fact that the Eichmann trial long labored under the critique of, uh, the, under the shadow of the critique of Hannah Arendt. Uh, and I think it's hard to imagine a, another uh, moment of Im historical importance which has been so, the meaning of which has been so monopolized by a single work. Uh, but that said, even if you look, for example, at this recent book that was published by Deborah Lipstadt that some of you might be familiar with, that was recently uh, reviewed in the New York Times, you'll see that this book, which at least in part is intended to liberate the trial from the terms of the Arendt critique, that it conspicuously, conspicuously fails to consider the legal legacy of the trial, which at least in my mind is an astonishing omission in a book about a legal event. So in my talk this afternoon, I'll probably talk about 40 minutes, um, I'm going to try to rescue, however modestly, the Eichmann trial from its decades of comparative neglect at the hands of legal scholars. And I hope this won't um, be too technical in the discussion, but I'm going to try to show that the Eichmann trial, more than the Nuremberg trial, anticipated, if not paved the way, to more recent developments in international criminal law. Or to put it maybe somewhat differently, um, I believe that our contemporary paradigm of uh, international criminal law, something I'm going to call the, the jurisprudence of atrocity, that this paradigm bears more similarities to the jurisprudential profile of the Eichmann trial than it does to the Nuremberg trial. And so although Arendt uh, faulted the Eichmann trial for failing to build on the Nuremberg precedent, the Eichmann trial, I'm going to argue, in fact, helped deliver a more durable and a more attractive template for the future development of international criminal law than did Nuremberg. Now, as we recall, um, the 21 defendants who appeared before the uh, Nuremberg Tribunal stood trial for three substantive crimes, three substantive crimes, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And there was also a fourth kind of organizational offense called conspiracy. You're going to leave aside. Now, genocide, which in many, I think many of us today consider kind of paradigmatic international crime, um, was at the time of the Nuremberg trial still a kind of a freshly minted neologism. It was just kind of a new term 
And, um, and it wasn't until 1948 that genocide was actually elevated by international convention to its status as an international crime and international law. So it wasn't at the time of Nuremberg. Now, if we go back and look at the Nuremberg charge sheet, from 65 years of hindsight, the incrimination that looks the strangest or most problematic, I think, is crimes against peace. That is the crime of launching an aggressive war. In the years since the trial, years since the Nuremberg trial, uh, crimes against peace has shown the least utility as a term of legal art. Um, it's played some role in authorizing the use of military, military force, most distantly at the time of uh, the Korean War. More recently, as some of us might recall, the notion was revived uh, at the time of the first um, uh, American attack against uh, Saddam Hussein, that is, after Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. Um, but more generally, the um, concept of aggressive war has basically played no role in recent war crimes trials. Um, the fledgling International Criminal Court, uh, that is the permanent International Criminal Court that was established in The Hague in uh, July 2002, um, it claims in principle some kind of future jurisdiction over aggressive war, assuming that international jurists can come up with a satisfactory definition. And jurists around the globe have been trying to come up with such a definition and sort of bedeviled their efforts. And so the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court over aggressive war remains largely hypothetical, and I'm certainly not holding my breath in the anticipation that they're ever going to try cases before that court involving the crime of aggression. But if we turn the clock back to the time of Nuremberg, crimes against the peace, that is aggressive war, was the gravamen of the prosecution's case. That is, it was understood as the principal international crime for which the defendants were accused. Uh, the history about how that came about is somewhat vexed, and it actually led to some controversies within the various prosecutorial teams. I don't think we need to kind of uh, look at that in detail right now. But I think the important point to emphasize is, even if at the time of Nuremberg, if the idea of aggressive war was somewhat anomalous, somewhat odd, its focus on crimes against peace actually made sense from a classic theory of sovereignty. Because by criminalizing the unprovoked attack of one nation on another, the crime against peace really could be seen as a coherent gesture to safeguard and not to us usurp the larger system of sovereign nation states that kind of goes back to the uh, peace of Westphalia. So I would express the jurisprudential theory of the Nuremberg trial um, in these terms. I would say that on certain rare occasions, such as in the case of transparently unprovoked warfare, it may be necessary to puncture the shield of immunity that normally safeguards state actions, that is, establish an international uh, court, but only ultimately to the end of preserving and protecting that system of nation states. And from this perspective, the decision to treat aggressive war as the paradigmatic international crime made perfect sense in 1945. So the IMT, that is the Nuremberg Tribunal, could thus be seen as protecting the Westphalian system of nation states from the destabilizing effects of unprovoked warfare. Uh, this jurisprudential understanding informed the construction and interpretation of two other substantive crimes also adjudicated at uh, Nuremberg, both war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, I mentioned that there was this conspiracy charge. The conspiracy charge actually was interpreted very restrictively at Nuremberg only to cover crimes against aggression and not war crimes and crimes against peace. Moreover, uh, uh, crimes against humanity. Moreover, the IMT's, the Nuremberg's conceptualization of crimes against humanity, which is a crime that was first recognized, named at uh, Nuremberg, also fit this paradigm. Uh, the, I, the Nuremberg Tribunal concluded that only crimes against humanity, the only crimes against humanity that were justiciable before the court, that is over which the court had jurisdiction, were ones that had a nexus to aggressive war, a clear connection to aggressive war. Now, this simply meant that any German on German atrocities that might have been perpetrated before the Wehrmacht uh, across the Polish frontier on September 1st, 1939, just weren't within the jurisdiction of the, um, of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Um, now, you might say that the practical consequences of that ruling weren't particularly 
uh, enormous in as much as, as we know, the overwhelming number of atrocities that were perpetrated by the Nazis occurred after the beginning of the war. But nevertheless, there were atrocities such as Kristallnacht that were perpetrated in advance of the war, which then simply fell out of the jurisdiction of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Um, but the conceptual importance of that nexus requirement remains. See, I think the idea is that the nexus requirement, again, reflected the larger jurisprudential vision of Nuremberg. And again, by nexus requirement, I mean, just so we're clear about this, the connection of crimes against humanity to aggressive war. That's the nexus requirement. And again, it was perfectly consistent with this larger jurisprudential understanding. Because the jurisprudential understanding of Nuremberg conceived of international crimes in the quite literal sense as crimes between legal entities called nation states. And if Nuremberg empowered international law and international courts to shatter the prerogatives of the sovereign, it was toward really the conservative end, as I've said, of preserving and not supplanting the larger system of sovereign nation states. Now, the Eichmann trial completely shifted away from that paradigm. It conceptualized Nazi crimes not in the first instance of crimes of aggression, but in what I'll call crimes of atrocity, as extermination, annihilation, and genocide. The crime against peace, that is the center of the Nuremberg case, falls completely out of the prosecution's indictment in Nure at uh, the Eichmann trial. Um, not only did this, in a sense, redefine the Nuremberg legacy, but the Eichmann trial, I think, more importantly anticipated the subsequent developments of international criminal law. So, for example, if we shift our perspective forward to today and look at the ongoing work of the two ad hoc international criminal tribunals that are in existence, which you might be familiar with, the Yugoslavia Tribunal in The Hague, the one that tried Slobodan Milosevic and right now is trying Radovan Karadzic, and also the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in Arusha, Tanzania, again, dealing with crimes that arose from the uh, Rwandan genocide from 1994. If we look at the work of those uh, two courts and, as law, and, and also look at the work of the, this fledgling international criminal court, the permanent institution now in The Hague, we clearly see the predominance of the Eichmann atrocity paradigm. The Nuremberg's focus on aggressive war is largely in irrelevancy between these, before these tribunals, and now what dominates international criminal law is the Eichmann trial's focus on genocide, systematic extermination, and ethnic cleansing. The ascendancy of this atrocity paradigm exemplified in the severing of the IMT's nexus requirement that's no longer accepted, no longer required in international law, the eclipse of the importance of the crime against aggression, and the development of a rich jurisprudence of crimes against humanity and genocide, finds further elaboration in the recent jurisprudence even of war crimes. In the IMT paradigm, again the Nuremberg paradigm, war crimes stood second to crimes of aggression as the paradigmatic international crime. Uh, these were offenses that arose in the context of armed conflict between sovereign nations, war crimes. And yet again, if you look at, for example, the work of the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, in one of their early and most important decisions, they essentially just jettisoned the IMT paradigm, the Nuremberg paradigm, and said that for a war crime to be justiciable, for this court to have jurisdiction for a war crime, it doesn't have to be connected with international war at all. It can be an entirely internal, domestic um, event. Now, the rise of the atrocity paradigm, I think, is further visible in another key shift um, away from the IMT approach, again, the Nuremberg approach, and that is with the evolution of the role of victims and victims' groups in international criminal law. Uh, following the strategy that was outlined by Robert Jackson. Robert Jackson, who was the sitting justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, who then became the chief allied prosecutor at Nuremberg. Um, Jackson believed that the Nuremberg prosecutors should structure their case around captured documentary evidence. And this, this evidence was considered harder and more reliable than eyewitness testimony. And by the conclusion of the trial, 
uh, Jackson sent a report to President Truman, and in this report he said, quote, the case against the defendants rests in large measure on documents on their own making, the authenticity of which has not been challenged, end quote. Now, the Nuremberg's, the IMT's aggressive war paradigm supported this trial by document because there were very, very few witnesses, let alone members of victims' groups, who could offer any insight into the motives, planning, and preparations of aggressive war. Such witnesses simply were not available. But there were many, many highly incriminating documents that could be used. So as a result, the prosecution unfolded largely without the voice of testimony. And this then had the consequence of depriving that trial of an affirmative human aspect and turning it to, bar to borrow uh, Rebecca West's um, very memorable formulation into a citadel of boredom because all that came before the court was document after document after document. The failure of the prosecution to call more than a token number of victims and the virtual absence of testimony from Jewish survivors disappointed victims groups and really eroded the support for the trial within victim communities. The atrocity paradigm, by contrast, has come to place narrative and testimony of the survivor victim at the legal center of a trial. And here again, the Eichmann trial was path-breaking and paradigmatic. And however much Hannah Arendt might have lamented Gideon Hausner, the chief prosecutor for um, the Israelis in the trial, however much he might have lamented uh, Hausner's uh, histrionics, um, the Israeli Attorney General succeeded very clearly in his aim of capturing the hearts and minds of the public by organizing the prosecution's case around survivor testimony. And in fact, it even appears um, from hindsight that Hausner himself didn't anticipate just how successful the strategy would be. Now, I think a number of forces actually um, worked together to make the trial as successful as, in my mind, it was and to transform it into a critical historical moment. Um, the fact that it was staged uh, in the fledgling Israeli state, I think, played a crucial role um, as Hausner was able, very strategically and tactically, to link survivor stories to the ex existential threats facing the Jewish state um, from its Arab neighbors. And of course, Israel itself, uh, until that moment, as other historians have pointed out, had largely ignored the horrors that had been endured by a sizable portion of its own immigrant population. And so the use of testimony of survivors and narrative helped really to transform the uh, trial into one of these important zeitgeist moments. Um, in fact, I think it would be no exaggeration to say that the trial was instrumental in turning the final solution into the Holocaust. And by that, I simply mean to say that it took, it, it, the trial played an instrumental role in taking a terrifying, terrifying episode of state-sponsored atrocity, an episode which up until that moment had largely been treated and comprehended as one chapter in the overall horror of the Second World War, and now to liberate that from the logic of armed conflict and to say that this event is perhaps the emblematic event of the 20th century. As a second matter, I think the trial contributed to a reorientation in, again, when we kind of look forward to what's happened in international law since uh, the Eichmann trial, to a reconceptualization of the role that testimony plays in international, um, in the adjudication of international crimes. Um, if we look, for example, at the recent work of, again, the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal, we see that the right of the survivor to testify in court has actually kind of been elevated to an independent right in international law. Um, we see this in matters of voice and control in these trials. So both the ICTY, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, and the Rwanda Tribunal have procedural safeguards that are meant to protect the victim's right to testify in open court. Uh, they have norms that relax 
the normally or the conventionally rigid application of the defendant's right to confrontation. So it would be highly traumatic for, te uh, for a victim to testify in the presence of his or her victimizer. Um, it's the case that uh, they no longer need to do that confrontation and can do the testimony through video, something that you cannot do, for example, in the United States typically. Um, and also to a recognition of the right of civil interveners, of victims groups to actually intervene in and participate in the prosecution. Uh, if we look now at this fledgling international criminal court, that has also uh, recognized the right of victims to participate in proceedings. And it has even actually taken one step, gone one step further to imagine um, testimony as something, or, or the status of victims as something that gives a right, um, give rise to reparation claims. Uh, and this last right, this, um, this right to claim reparations actually goes further than anything was contemplated by the Eichmann trial. Um, because I think the Eichmann trial really almost kind of understood or conceptualized the very act of offering testimony as the almost kind of gesture of reparations, as the kind of reparative act. Uh, but I think, again, the Eichmann trial has to be seen as the crucial moment of transition that helped usher the lived experience of victims and survivors to the center of the international um, criminal trial. So at this kind of, I think I still have a decent amount of time left, I hope. Uh, 50. Um, so let me just stand back and take stock at this moment. So, the Nuremberg trial, we observe, saw the crime of aggression as constituting the international crime. This, I argued, made sense in terms of the classic theory of sovereignty. The Eichmann trial, I have tried to argue by contrast, embraced what I've called this atrocity paradigm. And this paradigm, I've argued, now defines the field of international criminal law. Ironically, though, Ironically, the one aspect of the Eichmann trial that jurists and international lawyers typically consider an important contribution to the development of international law, that is, its jurisdictional profile, has at least in my mind been completely misunderstood and misapplied. And this gets us into the sexy area of jurisdiction. Uh, the Eichmann court established jurisdiction over the accused by appealing to a number of different arguments, one of which was this theory called universal jurisdiction. And universal jurisdiction is jurisdiction that is conferred exclusively by nature of the crime. The Eichmann, uh, Eichmann the court reasoned, was an international par uh, pariah, and they actually likened him to a Barbary pirate, who pirate from an earlier age, and pirates were conceptualized legally as hostis humani, that is, enemies of humanity. And because they were enemies of humanity, any court anywhere was authorized to sit in judgment on such criminals. But if you think about this theory, under this theory, Israel's authority to try Eichmann was no greater and no less than any other national domestic court. That is, Eichmann could have been as plausibly under this theory tried in Sri Lanka or the Philippines or Canada, anywhere. In the decades that followed the Eichmann trial, this notion of your universal jurisdiction seemed to be really kind of a moribund judicial curiosity. No one really made a, no one really knew what to make of it until its remarkable revival with the Pinochet affair. Now, I don't know how many of you recall this. I just imagine many of you recall this notion that when the Spanish prosecutor attempted to get Pinochet extradited to Spain um, in order to stand charge for crimes against humanity that, again, were not perpetrated against Spanish citizens. That's the critical thing, that were committed against Chileans in Chile. And the remarkable thing is the Spanish prosecutor had a lot of success. There were idiosyncratic reasons why Pinochet ultimately never was extradited, but as a legal matter, the argument actually was accepted by courts. More recently, universal jurisdiction has been used in Germany to prosecute Serbs who fled to Germany during the Balkan Civil War, but were then later um, implicated in atrocities that took place in the Balkans. And also universal jurisdiction uh, made reared its kind of peculiar head in Belgium, where prosecutors, and again, I'm, some of you might have followed this in the uh, news, where prosecutors basically briefly tried to seek indictments against just about everybody. They want to indict 
Ariel Sharon, they wanted to indict Fidel Castro, they wanted to indict uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, but that this, that universal jurisdiction should be seen as the principal legal legacy of the Eichmann trial, in my mind, is deeply ironic. And this is because the Eichmann trial stands, at least in my reckoning, as the outstanding example of a very, very different proposition. In my mind, this trial stands for the proposition that in order for a trial of a perpetrator of international crimes to succeed in all its dimensions, to succeed as an exercise in retributive justice, to succeed as a tool of establishing a baseline of history, to succeed as a means of conferring dignity on the lived experience of survivors, that in order to succeed in these various respects, the trial has to have an organic link between the proceeding, the people, and the place. And the Eichmann Court relied on the device of universal jurisdiction to help anchor its claim over Eichmann, but the trial itself stood for the importance of really situating international trials in venues with meaningful, thick, and organic connections to trials before the court. Now, Hannah Arendt, again, this was the focus. I mean, she had a lot of nasty things to say about the trial, but her main criticism really was that the trial was staged ultimately in Jerusalem. And this was part of a kind of a two-pronged critique of hers. First, she believed that the trial used the wrong idiom of criminality. Um, she thought that the right idiom of criminality was available, and yet the Jerusalem court ignored it because the Jerusalem court largely tried Eichmann not for crimes against humanity, but for this kind of weird subspecies that they called crimes against the Jewish people. Um, as a second matter, that problem of using crimes against the Jewish people as opposed to crimes against humanity, which her mind was the right incrimination, then led the trial to commit a second grave mistake. And the second grave mistake for her was having it tried in Jerusalem in the first place and not before an international court. She really believed that only an international court could do justice to the global semiotics of the Eichmann trial. Um, but here I'd say that Arendt was doubly wrong. First, I think it should be noted that the 15-count indictment uh, did include multiple counts of crimes against humanity, but that's not my main point. More to the point, I would argue that the notion of crimes against the Jewish people, far from representing an abandonment of or a retrogression from the concept of crimes humanity, in fact represented somewhat of an improvement and a conceptual innovation. And I say this because I think Arendt is wrong to understand crimes against humanity in a strictly Kantian sense. And if you read her book, you'll see that she has this very thin Kantian understanding of crimes against humanity. That is, an offense against human status is something thin and universal and entirely abstract. And I think it's actually better and more accurate to understand crimes of atrocity as directed not against humanity abstractly defined, but against humanity as defined by our organization in groups and communities with shared attachments of religion, ethnicity, um, or national identity. So however imperfectly uh, this notion that atrocity threatens our collective existence as members of plural, plural groups, it's actually captured by the Eichmann trial's focus on crimes against the Jewish people. And this brings me to the second critical shortcoming, I think, of Arendt's critique. Contra Arendt, the fact that the Eichmann trial was tried in Jerusalem and not before an international court describes not a failure of the trial, but really a key aspect of its really brilliant success. Um, which again, the Eichmann trial paradigm, the one that privileges the local and the domestic over the international, it again finds powerful validation in more recent exercises in international criminal law. Um, yeah. Now, to make that claim a little bit thicker, I just want to talk very briefly about some of the things I noticed in observing the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the, um, the Rwanda Tribunals. Um, for example, at the Yugoslavia Tribunal, I saw a very interesting thing where a prosecutor, I'll give you just one small anecdote, in which a prosecutor was being briefed on Banja Luka crimes. 
And after being briefed on the crimes of Banya Luka, the prosecutor got all kind of agitated and said, well, it's clear. We just have to indict Banya Luka. Let's do it. Now, which made perfect sense, except that Banya Luka is actually a region and not a person. And what was interesting is this is not a person who was new to the Yugoslavia Tribunal. This is someone who had years of experience with the Yugoslavia Tribunal. The prosecutors at the Yugoslavia Tribunal, not a single one of them could speak the local language. Not a single one of them could really relate to the local history. There was a very important moment in the trial in which uh, Slobodan Milosevic, who, as you recall, he uh, did his own defense, not um, pathetic. He was actually quite able in wanting his own defense. The members of the uh, prosecution get up and say, we have to bring history in the courtroom. We've got to take this trial back to what happened in 1989. And Slobodan Milosevic gets up and goes, you want to bring history into this courtroom? It's not 1989 we go back to. It's 1389. That's where we go back to. And I really think that that kind of like highlighted a key failing of that trial in that it really lacked any kind of organic connection to the place and the people who were affected, either perpetrated communities or victim communities. If you look, for example, um, at the case of, um, if we compare the um, Milosevic case, for example, very briefly to the, um, to the Eichmann trial, even if you go back and look at uh, photographs that were taken of the Eichmann trial, some of the key photographs of the Eichmann trial were not photographs of the perpetrator himself sitting in the glass booth. I think those are the iconic images that we have today. But at the time, the key photographs were actually photographs of spectators of the trial who were responding to the testimony of other survivor witnesses. And I think those, um, those responses, those photographs of the spectators, that is, the witnesses to the witnesses became a critical um, area of primary reception for the trial, reported on, uh, these were reprinted in newspapers and reported on uh, by the journalists. The contrast to the Milosevic case, again, couldn't be any greater. In fact, there, um, to kind of keep with the image of the glass booth, it wasn't the perpetrator who was the glass booth, it was the court itself. The court was actually separated from the spectators by glass that was actually not bulletproof, but rocket uh, rocket-propelled grenade proof. And, um, and so actually, if you were sitting, so really it would be quite clearly the case that if you're the spectators of the trial, there'd be glass going straight across and the courtroom's over here. And the courtroom was hermetically sealed from the spectators. You could not hear anything from the court. The only way you could hear from something from the court was wearing a headset. And what was very curious is that even though the court was right in front of the spectators, there were also these TV monitors on either side. And if you watch the spectators at the Milosevic trial, they weren't actually watching the court. What they ended up doing is they ended up watching the two TV monitors. Because they actually, because the court was to the back of the spectators, so if you actually wanted to see people's faces, you actually had to look at the TV monitors, which I thought became a very, very powerful trope of this kind of denatured, unsituated courtroom. I mean, there was something about the courtroom that reminded me of as if Beckett had sort of staged a play in some kind of non-existent space of Kantian universalism. And I don't mean to naively suggest that Milosevic should have been tried in Serbia. Clearly, at the time, this was not an option. Uh, but I think these observations do challenge the alacrity with which Arendt challenged the priority of international courts, a position that continues to be defended by many in the human rights community today. And against this misplaced enthusiasm, I believe the Eichmann trial offers a powerful support for the jurisprudential vision that now undergirds the fledgling International Criminal Court. Because the International Criminal Court is based on the principle of complementarity. And that is the idea that even in cases in which the ICC does have jurisdiction, it really should only intervene when domestic courts lack the will or the ability to prosecute. The ICC then stands for the proposition that international courts should be used only as courts of last resort. And this is, I think, as it should be. And it's fully consistent with the vision of international trials that I think is framed by the Eichmann proceeding. So the Eichmann court succeeded as an instrument of justice, as a way of conferring dignity upon survivors, as a way of establishing baseline history, because of the organic connections between people, place, and crimes. Absent the intimate connections between preceding people and place, when a court attempts simply to defend the interests of humanity from a position of kind of Archimedean neutrality, 
I think the act of judgment threatens to turn into something arid and arrogant. And so we reach what I think is the surprising conclusion that the Eichmann trial, more than Nuremberg, delivered the powerful template for the future prosecutions of international crimes. Thank you.